Welcome, welcome everyone to Thursday AI, our weekly AI update show, the highest signal AI show update that you can get uh, every, from week to week. My name is Alex Volkov. I'm an AI evangelist with Weights and Biases. And yeah, this is, this is the epitome of another crazy week. We got a bunch of stuff to talk about. If you're tuning in for the first time, Thursday AI has been here for a while. We now have folks come up to me in different events and say, hey, I'm listening to your show. I listened to you this morning, etc." And I really love it. So if you do listen and we cross paths at some AI event or another, I'm going to be in a bunch of them for the upcoming months. Hopefully I'm going to get to Google I.O., but also hackathons in San Francisco and Microsoft Build and like all these things that I'm going to talk about as well. Please do come up and say hi and then shake hands and let's take a selfie. I really appreciate that. It's really fun for me to see that the show actually helps folks stay up to date, which is the whole point. The motto of this is we stay up to date so you don't have to because there's like an insane amount of stuff to stay up to date about. And with that, I think it's good for us to get started. As usual... I will just run through everything in my updates that I have as a TLDR, so you'll know what to expect, and then we're going to get started with, with some open source conversations as well. Um, this is the TLDR of every topic that we've covered on Thursday I on April 25th. We had a great show and a bunch of like very exciting updates about the world of open source. We couldn't contain ourselves. And I think we've talked about open source for almost like more than an hour because it's just like a lot of stuff happened. And also quiet on the big company front uh, this week. Not many things happening, maybe because some upcoming releases, maybe we'll see. But basically, let's run through the stuff that we've talked about. So in the open source, Microsoft open sourced Phi 3. I think this is like the most exciting model release that we've seen this week. Phi 3 is an 8 billion parameter, a 7 billion parameter, and a 14 billion parameter in preview. And they only released the 3.8 billion parameter for us with two sizes, basically 4K context window and 128 context window, which is incredible. And we love long context. Thank you, Renan Eldan and the team at Microsoft that, that released this. If you guys remember the Wizard LM previous release that's also associated with Microsoft that was taken away from us last week, this apparently model passed the Microsoft like vibe slash toxicity checks, which is super cool. Um, it is very surprising. We had a conversation about how surprising it actually is because it beats Llama 7B, like half its size, it beats Llama 7B. It also beats Mixtral, the previous like eight times 7B, so the eight experts, Mixtral MOE, it beats it on MMLU and Hello Swag. So it's very surprising that a model that's half the weights or half the parameters of the one expert beats a model with an ensemble of a mixture of experts. It's, I think it's based on Llama architecture, but the previous one, and it's MIT license, which is very exciting in the open source as well. So the vibe checks on this like split. Some people really don't think this model like is anything. And maybe there's a conversation about it being trained on some evals and benchmarks. So we had a, this conversation as well. I personally haven't seen like a good proof that they did. Uh, and I definitely, the folks behind Phi previously engaged with this conversation and, and showed that it did, didn't necessarily did train. And I think the conversation ended with, hey, well, show us the data, then we'll know that you didn't train, which is like nobody gives up their data. Used 3.3 trillion tokens to train this model from February to April. And again, MIT license, open, it runs super fast on your Mac, so you can run like multiple ones. I, I really like Phi 3. I play around with this. I shared funny examples of how it beats even Llama 70 billion on some like logic questions very basic logic questions we then talked about llama 370b for a long time because well llama 3 is a big deal llama 2 was a big deal and llama 1 was obviously like the firing a shot the open source race for us and so the conversation about llama 3 was around two things first of all llama 370b actually landed on lmc Serena and got enough votes to show that on the overall ranking llama 370b ranks top six it it was top five and the same day it got moved to top six because of some other updates which i'll cover in a second but also it's still number one in models that are open access so like llama 3 so like 70b is for sure the best model that you can now run yourself and it comes very close and beats some gpt4 on this human evaluation lmcs but also, Nissan mentioned that if you switch to the English only category, which LMCs now allows you to do to filter out like categories, which models, it ranks very close to number one, if not number one for some time, which is very surprising as well. And also raised some eyebrows, as, uh, raised some eyebrows around the use of LMCs and actually whether or not 
it's uh, self-selected and whether or not this metric is, is a good one for evaluation. It is still the best uh, kind of approach we have uh, and some together some vibe checks b b from LMCs and, and Twitter Arena and the local Llama subreddit. That's how we uh, know the models are good and the Llama 3 70B models are very good and we're still waiting for fine tunes. And so the second part of our conversation about Llama was about fine tunes and we've talked about multiple things. So we mentioned Dolphin 2.9, from Eric Hartford and Fernando Neta. And Dolphin actually improves the base Llama 3 on several benchmarks, but also falls short on some other ones. So actually the fine tune makes it worse than the Instruct version. And we just talked about how Meta is doing a lot of good work and they paid for human annotated 10 million uh, data set for the Instruct version and their Instruct version is really good. Uh, so we mentioned it's going to be very hard to compete in just like fine tuning this. However, a, a, a silver lining there is potentially merges between fine tunes of their base models and then their Instruct version could perform very well. So we're very excited about looking at merges as well. And also we've talked about Llama 32K context window and then 64K. And I think we got all the way to 95K. So we had an, an instant uh, co-host of the pod and then also Wing Lian from the Axolotl, the main term for Axolotl. He's been playing around with new techniques called Pose and rope scaling to actually like twist these models, twist these llamas. And the original release from Meta was 4K. And now you basically can run Llama 3 8 billion parameters up to 32K. And I think it goes all the way up to 90 based on uh, Wing Lian's example. So we're going to definitely keep you keep you up to date with the insane kind of context uh, plays that, that people do with, with Llama, but very interesting. We also, speaking of merging, we also talked about that evolution, evolutionary model merges techniques based on the papers from Sakana AI and Hard Maru and uh, Leon James they now landed in MergeKit. So Charles Goddard, the author of MergeKit, which we we know and love because many models get better with merges, is now they now landed evolution and merge support in in MergeKit, which is great for folks who are doing a lot of merges of these models, and great for the rest of us because I just said that the Llama Instruct version and the base version, sorry, the Instruct version and the fine tunes, they potentially could be merged with this like new technology. So super cool. And I think last in the open source, we mentioned the very huge, massive data set that's called FindWeb, which is a filtered and the duplicated common crawl data set. And it's a massive 45 terabyte data set, which like took down Hugging Face for a while uh, after they released it. And it has 15 trillion tokens uh, just for comparison, I think Llama 3 was trained with 14 trillion tokens, and that's like on the upper end of the models that we know. And now the data set of kind of that size is now open and free and you can use it. It has 12 years of common crawl data, which is basically like a bunch of websites as well. And it beats previous Refined Web and Dolma and the Slim Pajama, all these data sets that we talked about and the pile as well. And then we also mentioned that Snowflake open source something called Arctic. And the interesting thing about it, it may not be necessarily the performance of this model itself, but the fact that it's a hybrid transformer architecture. So we know that there's a dense transformer, something like Llama 2, Llama 3, like one file that you download. Phi is a dense transformer model as well. And we know there's the MOE transformer, Mixtrel and Grok and all these like mixture of experts. And Snowflake, which is a name we haven't mentioned before on Thursday, I don't believe, released a huge model with 114 experts, and it's a hybrid between an MOE and a dense transformer, and I will not go into more detail than this, but it's a 400 billion parameter total MOE, which is a lot. And they're talking about only like 17 billion are active. So we talked about how potentially this can run like very fast, but maybe not that great for fine tuning. And they're focusing on enterprise specific use cases as well. So going to be very interesting to see how Snowflake steps into the open source scene because they open sourced not only the model, they open source the checkpoints and the training sets and the code itself and the research insights. So they open sourced a bunch for folks to actually learn from this process. And I think for researchers, that's very important as well. We didn't have a lot to cover in the big companies and LLMs and API stuff. We did mention that Devin, the company that builds out the assistant, actually is now validated at $2 billion, which is like for the six months that they've been out and for the examples, it's like very interesting. Also, we had Alex on stage that then disclosed that he was an investor and he used Devin for some of the stuff. So he gave like a brief review and then disclosed that he's an investor, which is great. So if you want to hear an investor's take, definitely listen to his chime in. But he also used Devin as a developer. But also Perplexity is now a unicorn. So the search engine that tries to go after the big 
900 pound gorilla, which is Google, is now also valued at a billion dollars and is a unicorn. And their list of investors is basically everyone, but Lot Gill and Nat Friedman and Naval and like all of the people who invest in AI basically invested in perplexity, including Andre Karpati and Jan LeCun and like some other folks from the industry as well. Great sh shout out to perplexity because I use them every day. And we mentioned that Cohere did actually open source their chat interface that's focused on RAG, which is super cool. And their reasoning behind this is people who want to build some RAG stuff, they actually don't want to build the UI and they get stopped at the UI level. So Cohere wants to sell you the RAG services. So they open source their RAG focused UI interface, which is great to see and it's very polished. So thank you Cohere for that. Vision and video category. So we talked about TL Draw, the whiteboarding slash pro prototyping kind of tool. They released like a cool viral demo they'll add to the show notes that does autocomplete for UI elements, which is super cool. You just draw a form and it completes other inputs for the form. And Adobe released something called Video Gig again, which is an upscaler for videos, and it looks just very, very good. And previous uh, video upscalers don't, don't come close. I'll add the video for this as well. It looks very nice. I also covered in this week's buzz category, where I talk about everything I learned in Wits and Biases this week. The last week, in our fully connected annual conference in San Francisco, we had the complete surprise and very lucky to have Joe Spizak, the program manager for the whole Llama team, actually announced Llama 3 on stage with us like two hours after Zach announced it on Instagram and it was super cool to have Joe on stage and I link to the video of that conversation of that talk from Fully Connected here and I also mentioned that I had a chance to chat with Joe and I actually followed up with a bunch of questions about the stuff that we care about and I talked about those as well and I also mentioned that we have another Fully Connected so if you missed this one even though I told you about it we have another one so if you're in Europe we have a London one coming up on May 15th so you definitely want to check this out. I cannot promise that GPT-5 will get released during that day, but maybe, you don't know. We did luck out with Llama 3. In the AI art and diffusion category, we mentioned that like LMSys for LLMs, there's now ImageSys from our friends at Fal and Hug and Face. So you can go actually and play ImageSys.ai, I believe. You can go and actually ask for a, a generated diffusion uh, image and then just rank which one you prefer better uh, which is uh, very fun to play with and definitely shout out to the folks who built it because uh, we need also vibe checks and and uh, evaluation on that as well and we also covered the kind of the hardware ai roundup with rabbit r1 having a release party this week i still haven't received a shipment date for mine but hopefully mine will arrive at some point i'm going to play with this and let you give you my thoughts on this we also talked about some disillusionment with ai pin etc and then I think it's time for us to get started with open source. Let's go. Open source AI, let's get it started. Let's get it started. Okay, let's talk about Llama's placement on the on the LMC Serena. And um, I think we have like, uh, it started with open source and then it switched into Arena updates basically. So we'll give like a brief update because I think this is quite ridiculous. Llama 3, there was released Llama 3, 70 billion parameters. So Llama, Llama 3 released with two sizes and a rumored or not actually rumored they talked about this but an upcoming 405 billion parameter dense model big boy that's coming huge llama but for now we have 70 billion parameters and we have a si 7 billion parameters or i guess eight they call it eight because the vocab grew and the 70 billion parameter is now i think top six on the lmc's arena on monday they the, the arena folks lmc's folks came out and said hey llama three the, the is the best open weights model that was ever on our arena and beats a bunch of like gpt4 versions from before definitely like the claude haiku and claude opus and all of these things and is number five and this was a big deal we expected this kind of we played with llama but four days after releasing this like insane model we we then got an update that this is the best model that you can possibly run and like beats significant like closed source models as well and you can run this essentially on your Mac. So I actually ran Llama 70B on, your, on my Mac. I think that Nisten is able to run this even without some GPU, some crazy hacks as well. And this was quite a big thing. I really wanted like to call out like how much this means for us who follow the arena and updates and everything. This is an open waste model that, that you could argue why Zuckerberg and Meta released it uh, and uh, to the open source, but they basically gave a very clear answer. If everybody starts using something like this, it, it saves them 
money on inference down the road. And we've seen this with Grigory Girganov and the GGEF format and, and the rope scaling stuff, which we're going to cover a lot in this show as well. And now this model is, uh, I think, number six. It moved down a notch a little bit. But still, this is quite insane that we have this ability to run what's better than the chat GPT when it was released, basically fully offline. I know definitely that I celebrate this a little bit. Nistan, what's, what's your what's your feelings about seeing this happening? It's, you know, just... it's number five or number six in multilingual mode. In English only, I think at one point it was number one. <laughs> it was number one. It was, yeah, it was just right up to the newest GPT-4, and it was only very few points below it. This is an excellent model. I don't know what stack of tricks they have thrown at it. Pruning and continuous merging, and I'm hearing all kinds of speculation in terms of the way the training was done. But yeah, I've been using both models daily, running long context benchmarks, actually using them to troubleshoot themselves because now you can just fire it up in the terminal. It's only like a four or five gig download. And you don't even need to leave the terminal. You can just ask the terminal to fix issues <laughs> and write you the shell scripts. And uh, this, it, yeah, uh, I'll try to find a link for the, the English-only leaderboard. It, it's just so nice to you. Like the, the model is, it, it, it does stuff for you. And it's super nice about it. Absolutely. we got a good one here. Definitely, we got a significantly upgraded LLM powered model for us. I will say that the thing, Nistin, that you mentioned that English only, LMC has recently added categories so you can drill down models based on different things. And so overall is their overall arena that we use in the average. I will also call out that a confusion that I did on the show before, and I, I want to retract this. I had an idea that was mistaken eventually that the arena ELO score that they calculate is actually a mix of human votes and also like empty bench, which is LLM as a judge evaluation. And that's not true. And so if I confused anyone who listens to the show, that's not true. I went and checked this. I had a conversation with Bindu ready on, on X and then she, she corrected me and I looked and they do report empty bench separately and MMLU separately in the full leaderboard. But the arena ELO score is only human kind of like voting, nothing else, no, no other mixes as well. And which means that there's benefits to this. Obviously, it's like human in loop is one of the best evaluations. Uh, but also there's a bias by selection. Like the, the people who go to LMC Serena and, and vote are probably people who like more in our bubble and more fine tuned into like the interests maybe. It's very interesting listening to what you're saying that it was number one in English because um, even though this model is incredible, the, there's still a few drawbacks, right? And so I think the, the one thing to mention is besides the self-selection of folks who go on the arena and vote, uh, arena also has a drop-down filter for longer query. Longer query, I don't know how they define what longer specifically is. And if you do, let me know. I don't know like where the cutoff that they have, but this is for folks who are doing more of a conversational thing rather than just one one question and then they vote which one was better. And yeah, very exciting stuff. And definitely on English, it, it's performing very well, very surprising. And could be a result of some bias. I did see some folks starting to doubt, though, the quality of this level of evaluation, given that a model that's just 70 billion parameters like beats something like Opus and beats something like a GPT-4 preview, which with all due respect to Meta, there's like incredible people in OpenAI and, and Anthropic that work on these models, and they have a bunch of our LHF as well. Go ahead, Nissan. Yeah, so I think AI developers and stuff tend to like emojis a lot. So when you get summaries and stuff like that, that have very nice formatting, very nice emojis, we might not even look at the answer too much, but as long as it like it, it looks pretty and it, it looks nice, it's very well structured, then we're like, okay, I can work with that. I can add a rack to that later. So I prefer that answer. But again, as, as you said, there are other tests which people are not doing. And the stuff like day-to-day -day work, you're trying to troubleshoot something technical. It doesn't have to be code. It could be just following up on a very long conversation and picking up a bug and then suggesting a clever solution. So in those tests where people tested not just coding, but medium and hard level problems, for example, I remember before they compared GPT-4 and Opus, they actually did find that GPT-4, even though it wasn't 
as nice in the responses, it did more often give smarter so solutions, like for mid and higher level uh, coding problems. So there's that to to keep in mind as well. That uh, again, yeah, as as you said, the the people that, that test this are very dialed in and have tend to have certain distribution of preferences in what they see from a model. Absolutely. I want to welcome LDJ to the stage. LDJ, welcome. Thoughts on, we're talking about Llama 3 taking like positions almost the first in the English cutoff, but also overall, I think it's still number six. Um, yeah, I got to play around with it a little bit, just like I think a lot of people have and meta.ai, if anybody's curious and hasn't used it yet, you could use it there. Yeah, it seemed really intelligent. Uh, I didn't play around in coding too much, but from the basic coding tests I gave it, it did pretty good. And just the overall naturalness, I think is really good. A lot of people complained with the original five models, for example, that they were really good in textbook type of things, but really bad at natural conversation. But this is, seems like the natural conversational ability for these llama models is really good. I have to say that I had, we're going to get to this in the phi section, segment, because I found like this like very tricky logic problem that's not super tricky at all. But I, I had Phi succeed in this uh, and Llama 7DB didn't. And the way it didn't was really funny. I think I posted this. I'm going to go and, and look and maybe add this. It tried to make jokes <laughs> when, when I asked for a very specific thing. It tried to make jokes and, and actually like, no, but actually here's the answer. And this was very surprising to me because I didn't see this behavior previously in any place. And nowhere in like custom instructions did I have a, like Nissan has like an alien raccoon or whatever. So I don't know if you guys noticed like a bit more of a personality thing, but they did talk about a like a very significant amount of human labeled annotation that they threw in in post training afterwards so maybe that's the outcome of that maybe that's what people preferred a little bit more yep i, I agree yeah <laughs> yeah it definitely a little bit more of humanity and actually let's while we're talking about llama let's let's talk about the fine tunes as well so here's the, the kind of the fine tunes roundup that we had the first one that i saw and i'm pretty sure that there's like other ones but the first one that i saw is from eric hartford the guy behind dolphin they trained dolphin 2.9 llama 370b and i think it's the case now where the branding guidelines say that if you're fine tuning llama 3 you have to mention Llama 3 in the name or in the fine tune or something like this. They really want like to, their brand to stand out. And so now get ready to see Llama 3 pretty much in all the names and the names of these models and these merges and these fine tunes are going to get longer. And so we now get Dolphin 2.9 Llama 3 70B. There's so many numbers in this name. But shout out to Eric Hartford and some folks who worked on this. And very interestingly, some of uh, Fernando Neta is the other guy who worked on this. And some of the so Dolphin data set from Eric Harford has been around for a while. Some of the benchmarks that they run on their evaluated model actually like a little bit better. Hello is a little bit better and GSM 8K is a little bit better. However, some of them are worse. It was very interesting. And I wanted to ask like LDJ and, and Nissan, is, is that a regular occurrence that the benchmarks drop after fine tune on some stuff? So MMLU is actually like three points lower, which is like to me quite significant maybe ask wing as well because wing please welcome to the stage as well because we're going to talk about some of the uh, contact extension but ldj is that a common occurrence with some benchmarks drop and some benchmarks get, get improved yeah that's somewhat normal ideally you have them all improving as much as you can but uh yeah it's uh, especially during the earlier phases of when llama first came out and people were just getting into fine tuning it was uh, more common but yeah I, I wouldn't say it's too concerning right now yeah, there's also a... Yeah, go ahead, Nissan. I have an opinion a lot of the devs might not like on this, but as far as all the 8B fine tunes, I've tested them, almost all of them, they're all worse than that I fine tune. They, they instruct fine tune, in my opinion. For the smaller uh, model, right? They've just done too good of a job with that with that fine tune dolphin is coming close to it mm -hmm. and again it does drop like three points in the mmlu and uh, i'm really excited for the open chat one because that team completely knocked it out of the park with the mistral 7b fine tune so that one might also come very close but i think we need to figure out something else here we either got to merge back with parts of llama 3 instruct because again they threw 10 million tokens at that fine tune like facebook did to, to make the instruct and i'm trying all of these and i i just prefer the 70b the regular 70b instruct even though these ones are a lot less censored and stuff 
think we need to see. I haven't tried uh, jo uh, John Durbin's uh, bagel yet. So anyway, it, it's still a bit early. Wait, I is there a bagel llama as well? I haven't seen. I haven't seen. Yeah, he he just pushed it out like a few hours ago on Hugging Face. Ooh, okay. So there's a bagel HD as well. Yeah. We like John Durbin. John Durbin, friend of the pod, he has a, a bagel data set that previously uh, came from Ouroboros, I believe. And he didn't even post anything. So there's nothing for me to add here on the stage. But Nista, if you find something or if you want to post and then we're going to add your link, please feel free to do. But yeah, we've talked with John Durbin about the Ouroboros data set and the bagel data set as well. Very good like baseline for merges, which we still haven't seen like a bunch of merges f for this model. But I think, Nista, you raise a good point. And maybe for some folks who are not like as tuned in into the fine-tuning thing as we are they released both the base models so the not fine-tuned for helping models basically do completion and also the instruct models which we they did spend a lot of money and we're going to talk about this in the segment with the weights and biases but joe spizak the program program manager for llama basically talked about the magic is in the post post learning with i think listen you said like 10 million additional data sets and people yep. uh, they have annotated like a bunch of like a lot of information to then fine tune and instruct and when folks from the fine tuning community do fine tunes they prefer the base models to fine tune on top of right so we've seen technium from news research and like some other folks react to different other models that didn't release the base version and say hey could you release the base version for us because that's the one that we prefer to fine tune on that's a little bit easier so what you're saying is whatever fine tunes we got the comparison is to basically the instruct fine tune from meta and that one seems to be preferable to you at this point as well i want to welcome our friend of the pod and co-host yam to the stage yam welcome as well we're discussing llama 3 i want to hear from you or your thoughts after a week of having access to this model we still don't have a fine tune that is better than the original right yeah, that's what we're discussing. That's so what I saw. The Dolphin yeah. one comes close, and Nistin, that's his <laughs> observation as well. The fine tunes still didn't knock it out of the park. Yeah, yet. Look, it's hard. It's hard. Like 10, 10 million conversations, it, it's hard to beat. <laughs> you, you need a lot. So, um, question to you, Yam, because you have a bunch of your merged models on Hug and Face, and Nistin, I think you suggested this. Will now merges come out from their instruction and something like a different fine tune from the base version? That oh, yeah, potentially sure. could be Look, this? the merges and ensembles and, and so on and so forth, they work best when the models are different, when the models are, are not correlated with one another. You need a large pool of models to find the right combination, you can say, to actually extract what we saw happening with Mistral, for example. It took a couple of months of people fine-tuning models to get to the point where people went merging like crazy and got two really good models at the end. I suspect there will be merges because why not? It's, it's free, people merge. But I think it will take a little bit of time until we're going to see a huge boost in performance from merges only. Because you need people to fine-tune on different data sets, on different domains and to have something to merge with you can say but yeah it's really interesting to see that yeah uh, 10 10 million conversations on original llama it's hard to beat they really went even if you have really good data it's really hard yeah they really went all out and, and i think joe talked about like their labeling partners that prepared some of this data set as well they did not release this though right this is like their proprietary stuff we, we didn't oh, yeah. see that data yeah. set yet also yeah. we didn't see the technical report or i guess like we didn't see the paper yet which they talked is coming as well right so the other fine tune that we did see and we, which does work and we have the folks who, who worked behind this here on stage with us and also some in the audience as well is the long context so when llama 3 released and we had two qualms with it basically why is it only 8K tokens in the context window now that we have models that go up to 128? And also, why isn't it multimodal? And the first problem with the context window seems to have been resolved by the community. So we have Nisna here and also like Wing Lian in the audience from Axolotl. If you want to come up and talk about this, please do. How is it that Meta only released for us 8K context window and now we have models up to 32 or 65 or so? Nista, I want, to, I want to directly ask you as somebody who's involved in, in some of the stretching, please tell the audience how you guys massage this model to get way more context length than it released officially with. We all went about it different ways. I tried to, in the, the group chat, 
in the group chat of this pod, I asked the author of the yarn paper, I asked Enrico Schipola if, uh, if setting it with yarn would work. And then eventually after three, four days of trying different configs and, and failing it, it worked. And I, I ran some successful tests with like 19K long summaries. And uh, this quickly got outdated after. Uh, but uh, the way I test for long context is I have some clubhouse discussions about healthcare, which is like doctors and other people that work in uh, health tech administration and stuff. And uh, those are those tend to be 15 to 30,000 tokens long. And uh, by dumping all of that in and asking it to make a summary and give quotes of the people, I can check manually if it hallucinates, stuff like that. Or even using uh, Twitter Spaces Room is a good way to, to test for this. And I tested it with the YARN scale, scaling method, which stands for yet another rope extension. And it worked. And so it, it worked pretty well. I think it, I think Yam can probably explain this better or, or, or Wing himself, but it, it chops the context up in different pieces. And then it tries to pick which ones is gonna, it's gonna pay more attention to. But then last night, so what I did with the 32k was not a fine tune. So that's just stock llama 38b instruct. And that even works, I did some really efficient quantization. So that that works. So hugging page, just, just use it, that, that works great. Even at two bit, it will give very coherent summaries. What Wing and the others did last night is they extended it three times more than that so i yeah and they used another method called poses pose so it's efficient context window extension paper and yeah it's positional skip wise uh, training that that's what it stands for yeah i want because I, I don't fully understand how roped and linear and dynamic ndk extensions work i just use them and, and and they work so if yam and, and wing can Explain uh, engine. Yeah, I can explain better how how they work. That'd yeah, I would like thanks, Nissan, and definitely folks should check out kind of uh, the, the work that you put up on Hugging Face. I think we'll, we'll have a link in the show notes. I want to welcome Wing Liam to the stage. Wing, this is not your first time. You're basically like a, a regular uh, p- person here, but also like you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, and previously, I saw you like in the Axelor and fine tuning stuff, but now you're also like releasing models. So what's up? T- t- tell us about the ninety six ninety five k contact extension now for Llama. How high can this go, and what is pose? Yeah, yeah. So pose is yeah, it's positional skip wise training. So what they do is they break up the context into two pieces, or in the training data. And what you do is you start the first half of the chunk of data at position zero, and then you randomly pick another position ID for the second half of the of the data, and you just and you train it on that. It seems to work pretty well so far. What we what I did was. Um, Take the original, so it's a combination of both pose and rope scaling. So yesterday we just did some experimentation with just like the linear rope scaling, and you and I believe uh, what was it? Was it 32k that you could just rope scale uh, llama three out of the box? And at, at least with the with the past key retrieval, it seems to do pretty well up to 32k. It was pretty much failing it above. It was completely failing above 32k even extended trying to extend the rope data even higher so what we did with the pose was we trained the model llama 3 to understand those higher positions up to 64k using the original uh 500 000 rope data and then extended it from there right now it, um i i think the the graphic that people saw was i extended the rope data to 2 million and it starts to fall off around 96,000 contacts mm. um I actually have in the release model, <laughs> I have it set to 8,000. So I'm rerunning the the, haste, the needle haystack evaluation right now. I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll post something as soon as I like, get results out of that. I haven't looked at it yet. I, I think I want to higher. Yeah, Wing, thank you. You worked a little bit doing there, but I think we got most of it. So first of all, thank you for obviously all your work, but also working on this. One of the qualms that we had with this like a shorter context, but as other stuff happening in the llama space like the community definitely provides and it looks like the needle in haystack work that you mentioned shows that it's doing very well up until 95k context window as well um but this does require like a little bit of fine tuning right Nisten, your version does not necessarily so um 
definitely exciting step ups from the community to extend the context link. I will say for folks that, you know, uh, running and Nistan, please step in here, but running at these context links like locally will probably be harder on your machine than running with the regular context window. Definitely, we still have the, the issue with a quadratic scaling of context, but it's very exciting that we now are able to run these models and extend them to longer contexts, as was the case with like Llama 2 as well. Yeah, Nissan, go ahead. There are quite a few tricks to play on that. So I noticed I could keep it up to... 32k and still use under 16 gigs of total vram you can quantize the kv cache so yeah you can do speculative decoding on its own long prompt so that it then generates it more just the one thing to keep in mind from for people here that, that are going to use these because we'll put them out is that they have been tested to work very well at taking in 30,000 K of input and then outputting something like a solution and stuff. They have not been tested to actually output 60 K or again, now when we say 60 K tokens, just think 60,000 words and a hundred thousand words is about half a book or a hundred pages. It's about, yeah, ballpark figures are a thousand tokens per page of book or a thousand words per, per page. That's how you should think of it. You'll be pretty close. And uh, yeah, so while you can just dump in a whole code base and tell it to think about this and find out where you did mistakes and stuff, it does not necessarily regenerate all of that for you. So for that, it is going to need training at longer contexts. And uh, for that kind of stuff, you run into issues where eight H100s are not enough and you, you need to go up to 32. So yeah, use the models as they are now. Just they can do an excellent job at stuff like summaries but they have not been tested to to generate stuff much longer than 8K. But also this is the case for even the commercial models too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think this concludes our uh, Llama kind of three roundup. We're still very excited. And I think even though the pace of this industry is like super fast, Llama is like a big deal. And we're going to probably have Llama, at least the fine tunes are going to start like popping up for hopefully open chat, Nisten, you said, and shout out to Alpine and, and folks who work on open chat. We're hoping to see some stuff from there. And uh, yeah, let's move on because... As we know, there's there's not a lot of stuff that, that kind of is persistent in this industry. And after the excitement of Llama 3, Microsoft announced and then a day after released Phi 3. And Yam, this is, you spoke about this and we, we should definitely talk about the comparison. Phi 3 is a continuation of kind of, I think, work on something called Tiny Stories, a synthetic data set that was created in a very specific way from the folks uh, at... I think Microsoft and Wiseman Institute or something. And now there is the third version of this. Previously, there have been debates whether or not this very, very tiny model, and I think Phi 2 was even smaller than, than, than this one, performs as well because it was just trained on some benchmarks or not. And some there was a conversation around this. Phi 3 now, the new one that was released, they released, they talked about three models in the paper, but they only released one of them, which is like a 3.8 billion parameter. It was trained on... I want to say 3 trillion tokens. Yeah, around 3.3 trillion tokens used to train this. And a lot of it was like a very specific synthetic stuff. And it beats Llama 7B on several benchmarks. So like a model half its size, only on benchmarks. And they also released two versions, 4K context and 128K context. So literally from the jump, you can have a very small one or 128K one, which is quite ridiculous and very, very welcome as well. And I... As you guys know, it's really hard to like, especially because it was it happened only on Tuesday, we're now on Thursday. There's a limited amount of time in every and a limited amount of just a place to store all these models locally and run them via like Elm Studio. So we often go off by vibes. The vibes on this one are split. And it's very interesting because I play with this model and it's tiny and it's super fast and runs locally. And I think it can be loaded on your browser as well. There is the Onyx format as well. And I really like this model. I'm very surprisingly really like this model, not for like full conversations, like it often forgets what you talked about three messages ago, but for very like logic stuff, I saw it perform better than even Llama 70B for some logic stuff. So yeah, you, you opened up this conversation about the comparison. What's your take on Phi 3? Uh, we've talked about this before, but they did some work here. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, the whole idea of Phi, uh, from the, the first one to the third one, the whole idea is let's make uh, an extremely high quality data and see how far we can push 
the performance just by the quality of the data alone, not by the amount of data, but let's see how can we push the quality of the data. So it started with the yeah, textbooks is all you need, when, where you create textbooks out of raw data, and it moved to many things that we don't know at the moment, but there are techniques to filter and curate an extremely high quality data. The thing is, the model is on paper really good, even the smaller version. We'll get to the larger version in a bit because it's re it gets really interesting to talk, to speculate what, how good is it comparing to Llama. But even the smaller model is surprisingly good. Is is If I remember correctly, I'm not in front of it, but if I remember, remember correctly, it is comparing to even Mixtral, the smaller one, on, on some benchmarks, which is insane. Yeah. I think it's three, three it point something billion parameters. It's amazing. 3.8 billion it's parameters. Way beyond. Yeah, yeah. I, I have the in well, front of me. I'll just add this and then please continue. 3.8 billion parameters yeah. of Phi Mini mm -hmm. gets 68.8 .8 on MMLU and Mixtral, the smaller Mixtral, not the Bixtral, gets 68.4. So it beats Mixtral 8 times 7B <laughs> by just four basis points on MMLU with a dense yeah. 3.8 parameter model that's half the size of one expert of the Mixtral. Yeah. So look, it is so it is a question uh, because it raises some questions whether or not this model will is just very optimized to be good on benchmarks or whether or not it's really good. And what we see now is that okay, it's it's not just the benchmarks. The model has something in it for sure and it makes everyone curious what the hell went into the data, how can we replicate this? This is one thing. The other thing is that the larger version gets really interesting because the larger version that we don't have access to is 14 billion parameters. And according to Chinchilla laws, it should be roughly the same as Lama, Lama 8 billion that we got now because, because Lama 8 billion is trained way longer mm -hmm. than Phi. We don't have any, we don't have any access to it, but it is really interesting to see which which of them is better in real life, because it, it is really interesting, because one of them is twice the size and one of them is way more trained, and it's really interesting because we don't have because it will help us understand how those things really work. Because as we all know, chinchilla law is is, is interesting. It gives you a guideline, but uh, there are many other things that influence the training. For example, the, the quality of the data, it doesn't go into this law and, and it definitely changed the, the dynamics of the training as we can see with the finds. Really interesting at the moment. And I don't know, we need, I think we need some time and access to the larger model because before we can say what we actually think about it, but it is surprising, I must say. It One thing out of nowhere. One thing I wanted to ask, maybe you and maybe LDJ uh, or Nistin or anybody else who has this information, did they instruct fine-tune this model? And we didn't get a base one for this one, right? This is like, they're fully like... No, not only, it's, yeah, not only we don't have a base and it instruct fine-tune, something interesting that people find out is that in the tokenizer, there are tokens that they're directing the model to where the data came from. For example, you have tokens for GitHub issue, or GitHub commit, special tokens, completely special tokens. It's not in text, it's one token. So you basically have uh, many different tokens that probably, as, as I imagine, come before the text to guide the model what the next text is gonna be about, where it came from. And so it's really interesting to see there is a sophisticated special token thing going on in the tokenizer. And, not going into too many details here, but I highly recommend people going into it if they care and interested how this works and what might be the magic behind it. So we'll... yeah, we, I think just looking at it, I think it was trained based and instructed at the same time. Just my guess. I don't know. I'm guessing. Yeah. So... Because the way the tokenizer is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I added the Nova is here in the audience and the 
tokenizer playground is something you definitely should should check out on on hug and face as an over the author of this and i added a link and i'll add this to the show notes of the of the show as well there's tokens like function output and function call which are very interesting i haven't seen any folks actually using like this model for function calling nor have i seen llama as well which is something we should probably get into at some point but there's other like tokens like gh issue and gh review which is probably we're assuming stands for github right and microsoft has access to a bunch of github information and knowledge that maybe some other folks not necessarily have and yeah there's nb marker so like python notebook marker there's a bunch of like very interesting tokens there which can maybe hint at what they're doing a very interesting thing so definitely check out the additional tweet on benchmark this model beats just like an incredible array of models that we've already got, which is quite incredible. But then also there is a conversation of, hey, did they train only on benchmarks on those benchmarks? And they specifically highlight the logic kind of uh, portion of this. And I wanted to test this. And yeah, I used your name for this because uh, somebody posted a very like uh, hard for models Sally test. Sally has three sisters. Each sister has two brothers or sorry, Sally has three brothers. Each brother has you know, two sisters, how many sisters does Sally have? Which is, the answer is like, Sally has one sister because she's she's one of the sisters of her brother. Some very basic like this, that many models of the lower tier, they fail on this like very basic logic, even if you ask for step-by-step. Step. And so I posted this question and then people started saying, hey, yeah, if it's trained, maybe this isn't data set. So I actually used Yam and said, Yam, who's a boy, because I, I don't know if the model knows the, the name Yam, has four sisters. Each sister has three brothers. How many brothers does Yam have? And let's think step, step by step. Very simple prompt to test kind of the logic. And we know that these models like spit out tokens, so they're not necessarily like math machines, right? But very surprisingly, on this question, there was zero chance that it was in a training data set because Yam, unless you put yourself in a data set and with this specific question, I just like, rephrased it. Phi got it correct and Lama 70B did not. And not only that, Lama 70B just said something. Uh, he is a brother to his sisters, which means that, that he is his own brother. Just kidding. This is the little Really? Yes. This is the, I didn't know that Lama didn't get this right. It changes everything. Lama 70B didn't the get this one right. The fact that I got it right is one thing, but the fact that Lama didn't. It, it this not, is interesting. Really. Not only didn't it, like it tried to make a joke and then didn't, which is, yeah. So yeah, so basically he gave you like four sisters. Very interesting. I, I agree. And it, it needs more play. And definitely Lama is like better for a long term conversation as well. And this, uh, I, on this topic of like logic and, and plays, you played with Phi and you didn't love it like immediately as far as I remember. What's your take on the small model? And then we're going to have to move on because we've, we have more to cover. I tried first the 4-bit one that they released, and it, it was pretty bad uh, at 4-bit. It, uh, it's really sensitive to quantization. Mm. But I do want to take... That was also just a, a first impression, uh, because later on, I tried to compare it with a, a Lobato Llama 3 fine-tune, which me and uh, Austin from Alignment Lab were, were making, and uh, it, it was actually better. Uh, I also tested to some of the tests, like you, you leave a banana on the table and you put a, a plate on top of it, and I changed up the names. You guys did, like it's a pomegranate, and you put a tray, and then you move the tray in another room, like where the pomegranate has moved, it's on the table. So it, it, it was getting those, but also so was Llama 8B, and it might be the temperature settings and stuff, but it, it's pretty interesting that it is good at first principles reasoning mm -hmm. uh, type of things. And uh, it really sucks that there's evidence that they cheated on the on the benchmarks and stuff because they, they did not need to do that. But again, training on benchmarks, benchmarks are good data. So it does, <laughs> does not necessarily mean that the model is is that bad it's just they didn't need to show i would love to see other evidence that they train the benchmarks i will just i want to hold off on the judgment that we know what's happening because even the last time we talked about phi even then this i think uh, ldj for i was here as well even then we had a debate whether or not we actually got concretely or is it like an internet thing but for now show me some of this evidence i would love to see any other takes on pi before we uh, on phi before we move on Oh, one last thing that I didn't mention is MIT license, which is incredible, which is use it and do whatever you want with it, which for Microsoft, if you guys remember, they released the first FI non-commercially only, the second FI, they changed it on the fly. So they released it and then changed it. And now this model is by default out of the gate MIT license. So some stuff from Microsoft there. And also, if you guys remember last week, we talked about Wizard LM releasing like a bunch of new models and then completely taking them back 
and Wizard of the Lamb is like a, a researcher is affiliated with Microsoft, and they took this back and still haven't put it up because th- those models didn't pass the Microsoft toxicity checks requirements, and this one probably did because it's now it's out. So it's very interesting that Fi compared to Wizard of the Lamb is also like passing those like very strong stuff from Microsoft. All right, moving on because we have a bunch of stuff to talk about and also we're almost at an hour. Snowflake released a ridiculous thing that's called a dense MOE hybrid transformer. Did you guys see this? It's called Arctic. It has 114... I want to get the number right because I don't have it in front of me for some reason. Yeah, I think it's 114 experts. And Mixtral has eight experts and some other places. I haven't seen this number be more than eight. And Snowflake out of everyone, which... I don't know if we ever mentioned Snowflake on the show here, released like this behemoth of 114 experts. I think it's like a complete 480 billion total and 17 billion parameter, like active parameters. So 480 billion parameters total. They positioned this model as a top tier enterprise LLM that's efficient, intelligent, and truly open. So shout out to Snowflake because being truly open, they actually released check points for this model they released training code i don't know if, what else if you guys want to chime in with the stuff that, that you guys like from what they released but also it's a new architecture so we have the dense transformer which is like llama 3 is a dense it's a one one model we have the moe transformer which like mixtral and grok and uh, the databricks released moes as well and snowflake is doing a hybrid thing it's called they called dense moe hybrid transformer which i We'll add to the show notes what they mean by this, uh, but I don't think we have a lot of time to go into this. But I, w- I do want to hear. Obviously, this is not a model you run locally. This, this is not, not with 480 billion parameters. So I just want to hear if you guys had a, a chance to think about this like new architecture or anything interesting that comes up from it. Actually, it might not be that expensive to run because it's only 17 billion active parameters. Yeah. In the end, so this is like an ideal model to run on CPU where you can just stick in more RAM in there and you'll still need at least like $5,000 of of server, but it's not uh, as uh, unattainable as it first seems. Like you're not going to need a whole uh, server rack. You, you, you can still like make a PC to, to run this. Yeah, b- because of the MOE infrastructure and specifically because the like the low amount of active parameters, correct? Yeah, and at at that amount, with uh, quantizing to to four bit and some other efficient mixed quantizations, should be able to get it to run on 182 gigs of of the Apple M3 Ultra, and there it it will be able to use the GPU and run extremely fast. Actually, yeah, this is this should be looked at a bit more because it's also a completely open license. And I'm not sure, did they release the data sets yet? Or so that, I don't remember. Here's the f- like the list of the stuff that they uh, open sourced. Everything is Apache 2 license. They, the weights and checkpoints, so not only the final weights, but also like the training checkpoints, the code to train, the data recipes, and research insights. So I don't think they released data specifically because it's no flag, but everything else looks like fully in the open. Uh, they work with NVIDIA, AWS, and like uh, other, other folks. And they do talk about the stuff that do efficient inference, Nissan, like you mentioned, like FP8 quantization, split fuse, which I never heard before, and pipeline parallelism, blah, 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 blah. They're focusing on enterprise use cases specifically, and so that's how they compare themselves to. And I really don't know about this active parameter as a comparison as it comes to running models locally. Some folks, especially the the folks who like looking at MOEs, they want it to be the metric by which we compare models, but I don't know. I'm not able to run or play with this model. So... There is a way to play with this model, and if you go to, I'll add this to the show notes, if you go to arctic.streamlit.app, they literally didn't even add the name in this, they just put it up on Streamlit. It runs really fast compared to the size of this model, 480 billion total, but obviously because just two, two, actually, I actually don't know how many, but I think two experts are running at the same time with the 70 million parameter. It runs really fast. And on that same question with Yam and his sisters, it failed so so, so because it runs really fast, I was really surprised because the answer just pops up. I really want to like just go and find this tweet of mine that, that I posted because you guys have to see this. I posed the same question and it just I like, left out loud because Llama 3 fails a little bit like in the same space. But this model that's enterprise focused gave me a very like complete answer with step-by-step instruction, etc. And failed this so miserably and gave Yam 11 brothers. 
which I just, I stood up laughing. I, <laughs> because it was like, with all the 480 billion parameters, all the training for enterprise, etc., this fails a very basic test. Again, maybe not fair test, maybe temperature was off, like all these things. I still, I found it like very funny. You can play with this on arctic.streamly.app and we'll post the link in the show notes as well. Very interesting as well. It's getting crowded up here. Justin, I think you mentioned as well that like why there's so many models. Do you want to comment on this like enterprise focused, huge MOE or hybrid? If you're here, Justin, feel free. Go ahead. Yeah, I just don't know why they build such large MOE model. Uh, it is a, a bit surprising to me because when we try to build MOE model, we choose eight experts because not 16 or 32 because it is very cost effective. It is very difficult to train such large models very efficiently and you do not have very significant performance improvement if you do not activate enough parameters. Arctic only activates, I remember, it's 17 billion parameters, but its performance is not that good, actually. Yeah, I think it's not very cost-effective. It, it's a success in training engineering, but not really for the model. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Justin. And folks, definitely give Justin a follow because they're also training a lot of models in, in Alibaba at Quen team as well. I think we need to hop over, but I think the last thing in open source, a super quick that I want to talk about is I don't think we have enough to actually showcase here. But if you guys remember, we've talked about Sakana AI, Leon James and Hardmar, David Ha are the folks behind this. Leon is one of the co co-authors on the Transformers paper and David is like this le legendary like Google researcher. They came out after GDC and said, hey, we have this like new algorithm to merge models and super cool. It's called evolutionary like model merge uh, model, etc. They released two models for the Japanese market and they performed relatively well. Recently, they also released like a diffusion merge model, which is very interesting. And pretty much that it since then, and now Charles Goddard, the author of MergeKit, the kind of the initial place where people start for merging models. And just a brief refresh on merging models. It's a technique that doesn't require a lot of GPU to take different models and kind of merge them into this Frankenstein model that performs better. So Charles Goddard, the author of MergeKit, released a new evolutionary model merges support in MergeKit which means that whatever Sakana AI did and all of these researchers came up with now is supported in the best place to the best way to merge models. I don't think we've seen models with evolutionary merges yet, but I just wanted to highlight this for folks who are merging. This is a new way and very untested, but like it, it now landed support. It does require GPU, unlike other merges. We've talked about this before, where merges usually it's just like algorithmic. And this does require a little bit of training, but not doesn't seem like a very strong one. Just a shout out to Charles Goddard and MergeKit folks, and then we'll, we'll follow up with like models that, that have very good results based on this. Nisten, go ahead and Yam, if you want to comment, and we're going to move forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll just... Quickly say that, first of all, shout out to Cohere for putting an MIT license on their RAG interface yes. on GitHub. And then back to this evolutionary merges, Get that a, a question for Yam. Yam, how do you feel about your job getting automated for merging stuff? What do you mean? Because it, <laughs> they'll be able, you got the number one 7B. The oh, experiment yeah. twenty six, I think. Yeah. So, so now they they basically automated, try to automate what you were doing by hand. Look, uh, <laughs> so. Experiment twenty six, first thing first is not just merge, also training and reinforcement learning and all sorts of uh, methods on top of each other. And the second thing is that it's also brute force. Define the combination that trains the best model. It was done by brute force. So. I'm all for automation and, and yeah, it's really good that we have something that developed that is also doing everything automated because why not? We just want the best model at the end and uh, wherever we can, why not? I really like the approach, I must say. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Nisten, and then we'll, we'll move on because we have still some stuff I to would, talk about. I would give it about another month and we're going to see the Alama 3 merges to top the leaderboard. I think so. Maybe well. famous last word. It might, it might just happen in 30 hours, but you never know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just going to say one, uh, I would say one month max. And this my that's my prediction. One thing that on Phi 3 that we didn't cover, I know we moved on, but coming back, I think they also moved into Llama architecture. Is that correct? I saw something like this. 
Can you guys comment? Yes. Yes, they did, right? Yes, they but they still used like the Llama 2 architecture, whereas Llama 3 now uses the OpenAI tokenizer. They they use the same tokenizer, tick token. So you'll see like when you dump in a big piece of text, the amount of tokens, it's equal between using the Llama 3 tokenizer and using the then using the OpenAI GPT-4 tokenizer. And you can check this, just Google uh, Zenova's Playground. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've used in my tests as well. And okay. yeah, shout out to Zenova's fucking face to face. <laughs> I use that crap every day. Funny, funny story that Zenova reminded me about this. Previously, when OpenAI was like the only game in town, I used to go to their docs and they had a tokenizer back then. And then Context Link started growing and their tokenizer, the like JavaScript, whatever they use there, did, did not have enough for me to put my transcript. It, it literally just didn't work. And I, I texted with the notes, hey, dude, w what is this? And they're like, oh, let me build this for you in a day or something. And since then, there's like a bunch of other tokenizers, like other models and other labs came up with their tokenizers i use the tokenizer like often as well so big shout out to zenova and i'm really happy that i like bugged you enough to build this so now it's like a super dope resource for everybody to use as well right folks i think that on the topic of open source i think we covered pretty much everything besides hugging face releasing fine web which is a massive data set, aka the gpt4 of data sets which uh, i think uh, the hugging face folks called it it's 45 terabytes of data <laughs> i don't know how many people have 45 terabytes you just, like, just like download this but apparently some people do because when they released it people started downloading this and then hugging face basically crashed because like, people started like checking like 45 terabytes of data it's 15 trillion tokens for comparisons that's pretty much the amount of information or the amount of tokens that llama 3 was trained with and I think 14, right? So it's even like a little bit more than this. And it's 12 years of filtered and deduplicated common crawl data. So common crawl is basically like the thing that crawls the internet and stores everything. Massive data set. So you basically now have access to the same amount of like tokens as whatever uh, Llama folks had. I don't know if you have enough compute to be able to, to run this, but I think it's a very good effort from the community. So shout out uh, Guillermo Penedo. I think he worked on the previous refined web. And so this is this is called Fine Web, and there, there were previous data sets before. This one outperforms Refined Web and Dolma and the Pile and Slim Pajama. So definitely, we have the new kind of crown king of data sets from Hugging Face. Shout out to them for releasing this, and thank you for making us better data in the open source. Always uh, welcome. So Cohere open sourcing their chat interface. Nisna, you briefly mentioned, definitely also welcome. I will probably try this out and maybe talk about this next week. And we're moving to big companies and APIs with one update. There's two updates there. <laughs> and all of them are not like the big companies. But apparently new big companies are around us. So Perplexity just raised and now became a unicorn. Perplexity is the search engine that folks uh, probably heard about at this point. If not use, I use Perplexity every day. I basically don't use Google anymore. I replace my default browser. I sometimes fall back to Google, but Perplexity has been doing a good job. And also their discover feed now is super dope. It actually like surfaces the news that I want to read. And they also have a podcast called Discover Daily or something. So shout out to Perplexity becoming a unicorn. It looks like <laughs> when you ask who are the investors in Perplexity, the answer is yes. So all of them, like Elad Gil and Nat Friedman, like all of the investors that you would think, Naval, Ravikant, like the answer is like yes. And also... Uh, they've been doing a very good job. And Devin, with six months out, you guys remember Devin, the software engineer, whatever, which we still don't have access to. I think, Alex, you maybe have access to Devin, right? I'm just, I am going to say, welcome, Alex. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the first time on the podcast. So briefly introduce yourself. I will ask you to introduce yourself later, but for this like section and for folks who haven't seen you maybe or, or know who you are, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Alex. Happy to be here. Um, yep, Alex is fine for me. I've been uh, uh, like, like listening to the podcast every so often or the Twitter space and um, been, I, I started Open Router and uh, my co-founder in April of last year as a kind of community contribution and it grew. Now we have, I think, around 140 models um, we can like talk to. Some of them are free and then there's like an API that works for all of them and works across providers and lets you filter for features like logit bias and um, min p and kind of complex samplers to get good results out of them. I saw you post about this. Yeah. Yep. So Devin is now a $2 billion company net worth, which is like six months out, which I found like uh, either a sign of what's coming, we're agents everywhere or something else. So I don't actually know, but Alex, I would love to like 
your quick thoughts on Devin and is the is it uh, supporting the crazy valuation of two billion dollars from your uh, using it so far? And disclosure: I am an investor in it, but I definitely think it's got ways to go. It's early, but the it's the best AI agent that we have, and and it it, it really makes it it, does, it it's like a junior engineer, and it feels like a junior engineer right now that doesn't learn super quickly, but the team is really good and they, I think they just know exactly what they need to fix or what they need to improve. And most importantly, they're sitting on tech that improves automatically. They're building, it's very high leverage to start a company where you can create the tooling. The browser is really key to making Devin work, mm -hmm. an agent that just knows how to use a browser, but the actual intelligence pr improves automatically. The, that's, I think, one of the key expectations for GPT-5 is that it will be better at coding. And that might be the biggest enterprise use case. For, so it's just like very well, well positioned and just having an agent that knows how to use a browser is super underrated. Imagine, there's a totally different example. Imagine if we could have one that knows how to manage Excel spreadsheets, but also can use a browser. And think of all the like Excel use cases where people really don't actually want to make the sheet themselves or interpret a sheet. You really need a browser. So they got that and they built a good UX around it. And now they're like attracting the talent that I think it's going to do really well. The other thing that happened in the agent space also, we should mention just briefly, Augment came out of stealth raised like $250 million for AI coding revolution, like a co-pilot competitor, and also like around a billion dollar post money valuation. So it looks like the agent startups are now uh, starting to be like unicorns all around, which is very interesting. And we'll see how that goes. And shout out to the Devon team and some of their investors here on stage, which is super cool. I did not know this, but it's great to know. So a brief reset, we're going to cover some stuff from Wits and Biases. All right, we're on the, you can call it the second hour, although we, we, we went a little bit long. So far we've talked about open source. You're on the second hour, the second segment of Thursday AI. Today's April 25th, and we have had multiple conversations about Llama and Phi and different other architectures, like a hybrid MOE as well, and data sets. And so we pretty much covered open source. We briefly mentioned uh, big companies and agents growing into the billions. And now I think it's time to briefly tell you about the corner that I call this week's buzz that talks about the stuff that I learned in What's Advice this week. If you tuned into the previous episode, you may know that I, we had our an annual conference called Fully Connected in San Francisco. And I could not believe my luck where the lightning stroke and the conference happened on Lama Day. And not only that, because uh, Weights and Biases works with multiple people, like pretty much everybody who trains foundational models. So we had a guest speaker from ERA called uh, Joe Spizak. He's the program manager. He's like the top guy at, at Lama. I think he reports to Mark. I'm not actually sure about this, but I think he's pretty much up there. And uh, we had the incredible luck. So while I was recording Thursday I in my hotel room while the conference was happening, I came back to the conference and uh, like 30 minutes afterwards, Joe stepped on stage and actually announced Lama 3. I think this is the first first announcement like on stage mark zuckerberg obviously went on some podcast and instagram but this was like the first like, real thing and i'm sitting in the front row and like super excited because you know it's llama day and we just celebrated this on thursday and here's the guy who, who basically run this thing so i uh, i pressured our av team and everybody to actually give a recording of this because joe did give some very interesting insights he also went into kind of purple llama and some security stuff that's very interesting because like they are gearing this model to use in enterprises and they have partners for everything as well so i will add this to the show notes as well you you guys will see i have a super cut he gave it like a very brief 20 minute i think it should be should have been a keynote but we didn't know that llama is going to get released and the nda like we didn't even have an nda i think so he didn't even share slides before he came up on stage he was like finishing them in an uber so i couldn't believe my luck i was sitting there i wanted to bring you that conversation i just pinned it to the top of the space i'll add this to the show notes as well the interesting thing that i wanted to follow up on here is that not only you guys should have listened when I invited you to the fully connected uh, conference with rates and biases, but also because Joe was there and talked about Lama, but also I had a chance to follow up with Joe and ask him a bunch of questions that we like to know. I asked him about context length. He hinted about rope that it was built in. I asked him about multimodality. He basically, his answer was, hey, 
These models were not necessarily ready. We wanted to call them preview, but Mark really wanted them out and wanted them built in. And so we released them and we're very excited about their performance as well. It looks like they, the, the engineers wanted to keep cooking and then the kind of the, the call from above came and said, hey, you should release those now. And we're very, very happy they did. If rumors to be believed, I think June was supposed to be the release, right? Uh, LDJ, back then we, we talked about around like June, there was like an announcement that they're going to get released. And this kind of feels, this tracks of what we previously thought about when these models are going to get released. I also asked them about MOE specifically, like why wouldn't they use like mixture of experts and why they're using dense models. The, the folks, the executives at, big, at these big companies, they're very good at evading answers. If you watch any podcast with Sam Altman, he recently went to Stanford and also gave some talks, basically because they can't divulge any information. They're really good at avoiding answering anything. So basically, Joe winked and smiled a lot when I pressured him on some questions. But he basically did say and confirm the multimodality is coming. And I think we saw this from the release as well. Longer context, now we see the community wing here extended almost to 100K, and this is going to come as well. But they did work on longer context as well. And MOE is something they played with. I did ask him about hybrid approaches and like Jamba and some stuff. He said that they, they did have folks who looked into kind of MOE and, and Mamba, sorry, not MOE, Mamba architectures and different things. They didn't really invest in it, looks like, and they potentially are excited to invest in this as well. He didn't confirm one thing he did told me as an answer to this is it looks from the outside as though they're GPU rich, but as any other resource, they're fighting for resources like within within phase Meta as well, right? Meta now supports Llama 3 and, and, and sends it to like 4 billion people on the platform. Meta.ai, WhatsApp, Instagram, like across all the products as well. So the, all of the 100,000, whatever, like 300,000 H100s that Meta has now by end of this year, a lot of this is inference, and they're like any researcher, they have to fight for some of these resources. It was very interesting that the guy behind Llama said something like, we're also GPU poor. I, I, I laughed because I had the GPU poor hat on my side from Fal, and I just showed him and we had a nice laugh because, no, you're not GPU poor, Joe Spizek from Meta. But it was really funny. It was a great conversation. I really recommend you guys checking out his full kind of like 20-minute talk. Or if you don't have time, just check out the supercut that I did, which has all the details that we care about. So this happened during the Western Biases thing, and I will have more to update next week. I will just say that if you're in London on Europe, a same same conference, Fully Connect, is coming to Europe next month. That's going to be May 15th. So if you're in Europe, you want to fly to London and just meet a bunch of people and maybe have another like lightning strike and some announcements on, on stage, definitely check out fullyconnected.com. With this, I think I want to talk about the AI art, AI art and diffusion thing. I mentioned briefly that we don't have anything to cover. And this was a lie, folks, because if you know LMSYS, our friends at FAL released something called ImageSys, which is kind of on the same thing. They released a, a, a way to play with a bunch of image models, and you basically vote which one's more to your liking, which is very interesting. So I think it's ImageSys.ai, but I'll definitely post this in the show notes. So let me see if I can pin this super quickly. I think I know who to go for. And ImageSys is hosted on Hug and Face, and it's basically like a bunch of image diffusion open source models. And you go and you play, basically just generate, either you generate a prompt yourself or you like let it to auto-generate and then you just vote. I will add this to the show notes here so you can check it. In. It's on the top now. It's really fun. It's, I would say it's even like a little bit more fun than the LMC Serena, the chatbot arena, because it's visual. You can like super quickly see which cat that you drew or asked for is better. Obviously, it's for free, so you can use the image generation there. So shout out to our friends at Fal, and hopefully we'll get like a vibe check on which like models also get, which diffusion models are getting better. And I definitely enjoy playing with this as well. In the voice and audio category, which we didn't cover, there is a, there's an update from so first of all, I wanted to talk about this. I don't have a link for you, but I wanted to talk about this. There is a resurgence of excitement about the guy who built Tortoise TTS. And basically, the, this guy like works at Google at something security related. And then in his like free time in his basement, scaled up a huge rack of GPUs and started training uh, Tortoise. And basically, as far as I understood from the conversation, most of the current very high quality text to speech engines use tortoise proprietary tech which he didn't open source he open sourced like a, a a way to create my create my voice but not fine-tune the full model on my voice and it's really funny that there was a viral tweet of the current tts models basically come from two people one that did it for himself for like my little pony and then this guy who did it in his spare time in his basement and especially specifically the reason i'm mentioning this is because first of all shout out to the guy who 
name conveniently i now forgot and i'll definitely add, add to the show notes but also play.ht which now is rebranded to play.ai they i think licensed door toys tts technology and they just released a conver- conversational voice platform and they're not the only ones we also had i requested at the top of the space the the name of the kind of viral marketing conversation thing i think they're from yc batch and the name is dylan let me see oh retail ai so there's this billboard somewhere in san francisco that you just like a big phone number you call and you start conversing with their ai engine and i just want to like first highlight the changes in this space but also say that this is now commoditized and it's going to get commoditized very soon like we've been talking about on thursday for a long time your voice could be cloned but also like these agents will have a voice and natural conversation modalities and it seems that this is coming like faster than we than folks are expecting because it still excites people how naturally you can converse with these agents and i found it very interesting and a lot of this is due to that one dude that trained it like in his basement who now by the way works in in open ai ARs and diffusion yeah and i think the last thing that i wanted to chat with and maybe need to get their thoughts as well is the a rabbit r1 release party and finally like people got their access uh, to this like hardware device that we got excited i have it on order i still uh, i saw josh josh who was previously in Corky friends of the path was now in rabbit as well he just stepped into the space we i'm excited i don't know Nissan, what's your take on maybe alex what's your take on R- rabbit r1 i will say that the excitement of mine about the ai pin was quickly disillusioned by people who opened it up people from our there's the ai community as well and it was dead on arrival it shut down it didn't work i my ai pin from humane is, is arriving and probably will get resent back to them like very quick but I'm, maybe i'll open and play with this but the rabbit because it's not a subscription and because of 100 bucks and because of the cool form factor of it i think i will actually play with this and try to have it do stuff but i wanted to hear from nista and maybe alec if you want to chime in on the rabbit as well what's your take after the release party and kind of some of the announcement that people actually used it as the whole intelligence thing gets commoditized, I think what people will actually pay money for is, is experiences. So it, it has to be a good ironed out user experience. You can't be assuming that it's just JavaScript and someone will fix this and it will just work on mobile and not look weird in the corner because that stuff will just kill the whole product. So uh, these things like making Polish products is it's a whole other thing. Uh, just to quickly, comment on open router because I, I never used it before but based on what alex said that they can uh, aggregate t- together different providers of the same product so it, it could be from aws that, that holds it or it could be from from their own hosting that's actually very useful because as a developer i've had those issues before where you only have one provider and you have nothing to fall back to and it just completely ruins things. And that's also been helping open source a lot because that's why companies looked at differentiating their, their providers. So that, that part of overall actually sounds really useful. Uh, but o- overall, I think the pin kind of got killed by the latency uh, hardware itself. While it had faults, it impressed me that they were able to shove all of that in there and the charges. I think the hardware can be fixed. And I think the team there did a really good job. It's just very sad that they didn't pay anywhere as much attention to, hey, what is the latency of this thing? Is yeah. it over a second? No, do not ship the product. Is it under a second? Okay, then ship the product. <laughs> Whereas it was like four seconds. Okay, so you're going to still ship the product. Is that smart? Are people going to like that? It, it, it wasn't. And it's sad, like after all that effort, I feel like these gnarly little tiny useless things that uh, actually just kill the product i think they will fix it i think they'll improve the voice for the pen on the v2 they they should have enough money still left that stuff will improve but yeah don't skimp on the tiny little ui stuff that that's it's very important and yeah I'm just gonna land it there that's what th- i got excited about the the ai pin because the demos that jesse the ceo did actually was under a second of responses even for visual stuff which um uh, also like the big elephant in the room is like everybody reacts to, like why wouldn't this be an app or like why wouldn't like uh, apple for example kill this and we know from recent leaks this week that apple is going to do like on device um ai inference 
in the upcoming iPhones. Like I think Mark Gurman reported on this. Mark Gurman previously, like very high quality. We had Robert Scoble before talk about like Mark Gurman's like very high track high track record of like actually knowing what Apple's going to get released. And Apple also gave us little hints in the open source. We we didn't briefly <laughs> we covered this. We didn't have time. But uh, Apple actually released a few models. They're tiny, but they released a few models and a way to train them. They're called Open Elm, and I'm gonna add this to the show notes as well. They're not like not comparable to any LLMs that the folks are now run, but they did release a few models this week. And they're definitely hinting at like local inference models. And we see stuff like Fi, like potentially being able to run on iPhone. I think like people even run on browsers like Fi, but definitely on, on iPhones as well. So we'll see how these hardware devices that are trying to compete basically with my phone will fare when Apple is building like native AI into my phone, whether or not that's going to be multimodal or not. Robert Scoble talks about the next year is going to be multimodal. So it's going to be very exciting to see. I think, folks, we've been at this for more than uh, two hours at least. I will do like a brief recap and I'll let you go to see what else is out there. We didn't have breaking news, but we definitely have a lot of, we definitely had a lot of exciting stuff that we've talked about this week. And this is everything that we've talked about on Thursday I for April 25th. If you like this and this is your first time listening to the show, please subscribe. The show on X is a live show that we do every Thursday. And then I work hard to deliver the same day a newsletter that covers everything we talked about with links and show notes and also a podcast. So if you're not subscribed to the podcast, it's on every platform on Spotify and Apple and everything. And this is everything we talked about. I really want to shout out and all the hosts and co-hosts that we had here. Nistan, LDJ, our guest Alex. We had uh, Justin and Yam as well. And just a bunch of very great folks. Oh, also Wing Lian from Axolotl came up and talked about him extending Llama. So I really appreciate everybody's joining on stage and talking. But I also appreciate everybody here who's listening from week to week. And shout outs and reposts and retweets and says, hey, this is a very interesting uh, AI update for you. This is why we work hard to bring you everything. Our motto is we stay up to date so you don't have to so with that i want to thank you all for joining this week and yeah a bunch of exciting news probably going to come up next week and we're going to be here to cover all of them as well with that thank you and have a nice thursday everyone 